As you can imagine, with everything that's unfolded since the senseless killing of George Floyd, uh, we're approaching the show very differently this week. I had a great conversation earlier today with W. Kamau Bell, someone I really respect, and uh, I'd like to get right to that. So without further ado, here's my conversation with W. Kamau Bell. With what's been going on in the streets of our nation over the past week, I wanted to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a friend of our show who's not only a comedian, uh, but a longtime advocate for racial justice. He's the celebrity ambassador on racial justice for the ACLU, and he sits on the advisory boards of organizations like Donors Choose, which raises money for public schools, and Hollaback, an anti-harassment organization. Please welcome the host of CNN's Emmy award-winning United Shades of America, W. Kamau Bell. How are you doing? You know, uh, everybody asked that question. My family's healthy, we're fine, but we're also getting feral with staying at home and not going to school and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, obviously uh, I wanted to start um, we did a show uh, on Monday uh, and I talked to Van Jones and I very much wanted to make that about uh, listening, but clearly that's maybe for me the first step and there is now so much more to be done, which is uh, I think a lot of us are feeling, I, I, protests are fine, but what can we do? Mm -hmm. And when I say we, I mean all of us and people like myself, what can we do to make this situation better in a practical, pragmatic way? Well, I mean, I think the I would, you know, I would, first of all, I want to make clear that when you say we, let's be clear that I feel like you're saying white people as we, because I feel like black people, brown people, people of color, we have always done this work and we've yeah. always had to figure yeah. out what to do in situations where, we had very little. I mean, if you I imagine Conan, I know it's gonna be it's gonna be hard to imagine. Imagine being Harriet Tubman. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, I, do, and, I do that all the time. <laughs> I know you were up for the movie, but uh, <laughs> missed uh, it by that much. By that much, Harriet Tubman was an enslaved African who had no resources at all and had to imagine what can I do? And you know, and now she's in a rightfully so an American hero because in that moment she just got to work. And so I think black people, especially black people, have always had to figure out what to do. So I really put it on white people to go, what do you see that you want to do? I think a lot of times white people get caught up in like being scared of doing it wrong. And I'm like, yes, be confident you're gonna do it wrong. That's how the work gets done. You know, MLK, didn't, his first move wasn't the March on Washington. They did a lot of things to prepare for that. You're gonna get it wrong, white people. Get used to doing it wrong. You're gonna get do something you feel good about, and then somebody's gonna call you out for doing it the wrong way. And you're gonna have to get used to sitting in the space of like not doing the work right. But right now, a lot of white people are frozen by the, I don't know what to do, so I'll do nothing. And that's why black people get, get uh, brutalized by police officers over and over again, because white people go, oh, that was so bad. I feel so bad. But then a couple weeks later, back to my yoga classes, and right now, right. there's not going back to yoga classes because there's a global pandemic right now. Right. Um, there is a sense that right now, protests are very visual. This is anyway how I'm feeling, that you see a lot of people, and you, especially you see a lot of celebrities being very visual about their protesting. And then the concern, I would think, and rightfully so, would be, this is fine maybe in this moment to be visual and to be on the front lines, but how are you gonna follow up on this three, six, nine weeks from now, next year, the year after that, to make America what it should be? Well, and I think that's, a, that's the important point because even if you, Conan O'Brien, go out to a protest, you're going to get a lot of attention. People are going to sh people that that image is going to go viral all over the world. Uh, you know, people are going to notice it. But then black folks are always like, what's Conan doing in his life? Right. And I think it, I think right now it's very important to connect your life to the actual movement and to the actual making change. Because believe me, if you if you said uh, black Americans, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a complete internal audit of my show. I'm gonna ask TBS to do the same thing of where the black folks work at TBS, where the people of color work and not give you the percentage of the total, but go at what level they are at. 
how many people are at the top level, how many people are at the, at the lowest levels at TBS in my show. And then I'm going to tell you that. And then in a year, it's going to look different. And I'm going to show you what that looks like. I'm going to tell you about my personal life, like in my personal life, how many black people I interact with in my day. And in a year, I'm going to work hard to make that look better. And I'm going to, right now we need white people to show their work. You know, it's not enough to say, I'm going to read uh, Michelle Alexander's book. It's enough to go, I read it and here are my thoughts. Does anybody have thoughts about my thoughts? I think right now, a lot of white people, it's easy to sort of like change your Twitter avi to a black background or to Black Lives Matter. But eventually you're going to turn it back to that wacky picture. You know what I mean? So we right. need white people to not only do the work, but show their work because we can't trust that the work's going to get done because all these articles are written, blogs are written, the government's done studies. Uh, uh, the Kerner Commission was a study that said white supremacy is the rule of the land. And this is why these things are happening. But the work doesn't get done. We need white people to show their work right now. The um, something that's occurred to me uh, and, and I'm sure occurred to a lot of people, but Money in our society is a very powerful uh, an engine, maybe the most powerful engine, where it goes, how it's used. And it, 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 yes, there's a lot of rhetoric and the rhetoric is very important, but sometimes you think, where, how am I, how am I uh, helping black owned businesses? How am I employing uh, people of color? What are we doing to make sure that student debt, student loan, and the price of education isn't leaving out a huge portion of society from getting an education? What are the practical things we can do now that last? Mm -hmm. And well, I mean, there's there's two different there's two different things. There's what can you do that lasts, but also what can you do right now? There's the the house is on fire put out the fire and then there's like rebuild the house. So I don't want people to get caught up in like, I can give $50 here, but what can I do? Give the money you have now to support the causes. And I'm happy to send you some causes your way if you don't know what those are. But then again, it's really about how you are in your personal life. Cause if your personal life is correct, your public life usually is more correct. Right. If you are personally invested in this, if you're personally like, you know what, we don't have enough black people on this show in high positions. So I'm going to make sure we go out and find those people. And I'm going to put out a call for this. We're, I don't have enough. I don't have enough black people in my personal life that I'm employing or get taking re, or taking uh, advice from. I'm going to change that. It's to me, it's like a lot of this is focused on outside and it really needs to focus on inside because black people, we don't do this work for black people. We do it for ourselves. And one thing white people need to get is that fight, fighting white supremacy being an anti-racist should be a selfish act because if the world is more equitable and just for black people and people of color, it's automatically better for white people. It just doesn't, it's, it's, it, this is truly the rising tide that lifts all boats, but right. But I think a lot of times white people feel like I'm doing it for them. I did this for them. I'm done with what I'm doing for them. And that's why it doesn't, the work isn't lasting. Right. I, I think, uh, especially anybody who has children knows your children, and, and this is for any, anybody, I mean, I think about this a lot. I want it to be a fairer world because a fairer and more just world is a safer world for my kids. So that is a way to see it in, if, uh, in a very selfish way, but a very primal way. If you're a parent who loves your child, I, I want my child to be walking around streets where the other people walking those street, streets feel that they have a stake in society because then my child's safer, uh, they're living in a happier world. So yeah. selfishness is not a bad thing. Selfishness is very natural. And it feels to me that that's- I, I, think, I think it is, I think, it, I think describing it as selfishness, and I've done this too, is helpful to people because stop thinking like I'm doing it because I'm a good person. As you just said, a, a world that is more just and equitable is better for your kids. It's a safer world, but it's also a more fun world. <laughs> you know, the, you know yeah. The, the, yeah. The, the best uh, music festivals are the one that have all the music there. Cause it's like, it's, we get to hang out with everybody. It's like, it's not, it's not just a more like, it's not, again, we get caught up in the high mindedness of this, get caught up in the humanity of it. Get caught up in the fact that it's just a, it's a more, your children will be more so, more actualized. They'll have more freedom of expression. They'll take in more information. I mean, one of the base things about being a parent is getting your kids to not just eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. 
because that's not a good life. That's not a, that's not a life that leads you down a good direction. It's about we're act, parents are actively expanding our kids' palates, but you have to do the same thing with your kid's brain. And I'd say, I encourage you, I don't know how old your kids are. How old are your kids? I have, my, my son is 14 and my daughter is 16. Okay. I mean, I think it's, it's important to know what they're reading. It's important yeah. to put both those kids could put, you could put the autobiography of Malcolm X right in their hands today and they're ready for it. You know, right. I, th I think it's important to know, to encourage them to not just read the things they want to read or being assigned, but really reach out to other sources that both those kids could read ta Coates, but then you should read it too. And then talk to them about it. But with my kids, with parents of little kids, don't get books that it feature more diverse images. I'm a big fan of Mo Willems big fan of Sandra Boynton, but also big fan of Selena Alco and big fan of, of, of Doc McStuffins and other things that actually reflect the world that, I, that, that my kids can see themselves in. There's a lot of talk in the last two, three days about uh, Black Lives Matter and then uh, pe some people saying, well, all lives matter and then uh, uh, people getting very angry and saying, you don't understand what you're saying uh, when you say all lives matter, even though if you take that situation in an, or that sentence in and of itself out of context, yes, you don't disagree with it. But when you look at it in the context, that's very upsetting to people. And I'd, I'd like to talk about that or hear what you have to think, say about it. I mean, the phrase Black Lives Matter is intentionally provocative. It was a phrase that was created by uh, three uh, black women uh, Opal Tometi, Alicia Garza, and Patrice Cullors in the wake of the Trayvon Martin uh, murder by George Zimmerman. And it, it was a declaration of like, we need people to know Black Lives Matter. Uh, because at that time, and still, it does not feel like Black Lives Matter. The criminal justice system does not put a value on Black lives. This education system does not put a value on Black lives. So uh, obviously we're talking about the police, police don't put a value on Black lives. So that it's an intentionally provocative phrase. And here's why, because Martin Luther King's let's hug it out didn't work. Martin Luther King Jr. was talking about, hey, everybody, basically, can't we be friends? Rodney King's let's all just get along didn't work. So, so black people keep raising the stakes on getting the attention of white people. You know, NWA had a very effective way to raise the stakes for, to get the attention of, of black people. I'm not gonna say it on TBS, but Google it. Uh, it so yeah. Right, black people are sort of basically doing all we can to get white people's attention, understand how clear this is. So if you're bothered by the phrase Black Lives Matter, good. Now investigate the phrase. Because the fact is, all lives don't matter the same. If they did, we wouldn't have to say Black Lives Matter. And nobody, this is why if you use the phrase all lives matter, it is just an attack on the idea of Black Lives Matter. And this is how I say that. Nobody ever said all lives matter before the phrase Black Lives Matter. Right. It was only invented in the wake of Black Lives Matter. Nobody was walking around going, I just want to say all lives matter. Nobody said that. If somebody had said that, you said, are you OK? Do you, do you, do you need to eat? <laughs> <laughs> you need some sugar. You need some sugar and some carbs right now. Yeah, like yeah. that that line is it's like even the Beatles who were full of love never decided to say that. It's just not it doesn't have any meaning to it. So for me, it's like if you I understand that you get there, white people. But once you get there, understand why we're not there. And, I, and to me, I would challenge people who white people who do understand that claim that, you know, put that sign up in your front yard, put it in your window. Don't just put it on your social media. Make your neighbors see it. Have conversations with your community, because this is the thing. We need white people to talk to each other about this. There's great organizations out there. Surge showing up for racial justice, which is a white led racial justice organization where white people meet with each other. Because a lot of times you need to have these awkward conversations with each other when you're not afraid of what black folks are gonna say or over here. So white people need to do this work. Actually right now, Conan, I'm going to assign you a friend of mine to be in charge of your whiteness. Oh, okay, <laughs> all right. Yeah. Here we go. Get, I, want is, my, I want my assignment, I really do. I didn't come here just to talk, I'm giving you homework. So okay. give your kids the autobiography of Malcolm X, re, you read it too, if you haven't read it, and it's not, you can't just watch the movie, the movie's great but read the autobiography of Malcolm X and a friend of mine named Kate Schatz, who's a white woman who wrote the book, Rad American Women A to Z, is, deals with white people all the time about how to deal with this work. So Kate Schatz, she's on Twitter, I'll hook you guys up later, is now in charge of Conan O'Brien's whiteness. Okay, well, and also, I'm not just white, I am so white that that's a, 
putting someone in charge of my whiteness is this, this, she may decline. She may say, <laughs> that's too much whiteness for me to handle. Believe me, you, you've got enough public uh, stuff out there. She's familiar with who you are. We are, I just called her before this to say, are you good with being in charge of Conan O'Brien's whiteness? And she was like, whoo. <laughs> she 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 took a knee and she took some deep breaths, but she and she but she wrote that she did some math and she's like, I think I can do this. Let me. That's clear. like saying that's like saying, can you bench press? Do you think you can get to eight hundred pounds? Exactly. She's like, let me clear my schedule. <laughs> she's cleared. She's cleared her schedule of all other whiteness to be in wow. charge of your whiteness. Okay. Well, <laughs> I literally bad. just got off the phone with her. All right. Well, tell her she's gonna probably we're gonna have to live together. She's gonna. <laughs> okay, have to it's fine. Same. This is a twenty four seven job being yes. in charge. You know, I, I, I also, um, I'm curious about this phenomenon. I talked about it a bit with, with Van Jones and it's something that I'm trying to explore, which is how exhausting it is for black people to, ex to be explaining their lives and their situation to concerned white, liberal white people and how there's uh, a fatigue that comes with that, mm -hmm. which is, Please tell us, uh, you know, every three months or two months or one month when something awful happens, it, it's now become, it's incumbent on you to explain to me what's going on when that clearly should not, why is it suddenly your homework? It's not your homework. Well, I, I will say that I think that's, I accept it as part of my job. Like this is the, I basically get paid to do this work. So I accept it. But the black guy at work who makes less money than you, who you're like, I just need to talk to you about this. He's not being paid for it. I feel like a big part of reparations would just be a government stipend to give black people 50% more salary just to deal with white people when racist things happen in the news. <laughs> like that would be, I would agree to that reparations. No, but it, but also that, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's very, what I love, there's a, a, what I love about your approach is you're, you're a comedian, you're very funny, so you come up with these comedic ideas which are funny but also true and you think about it and you think, no, that actually would make sense if there was a stipend for how much, now I have to spend six more hours of my week explaining racism to concerned white people so I should get Seven thousand dollars. You know? <laughs> Those should be billable hours. It's like yeah, an attorney. Yeah, it should be Those billable. Are, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think, and I think white people don't realize that because you come to us like, I'm finally ready to have the conversation that you've wanted me to have, and that person's like, I'm trying to eat lunch for fifteen minutes and get back to my job. Right. And then if we say we don't want to have it, then you're mad at. See, this is why we can't end racism because of you, because you won't talk to me. Right. And it's like, and all of this is work and it, and it's work. And America has a history of not paying for the labor that black folks do. And this is just a part of that. Yeah. The, um, you know, I think I, I keep trying to find, uh, uh, some notes of hope in all of this. Um, I'm, I'm really hoping there are some as horrifying and terrible as that video of George Floyd being killed is, it, there was no way not to see it if you're uh, a white American and not immediately know that would never happen to me. That would not happen to me. I would never be in that situation that I would be treated differently. And I'm not even just talking about someone who's on television. No. If I was Conan O'Brien and I was a spot welder, uh, who no one had ever heard of, that would never ever happen to me. And I, 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 I think that is one of the reasons why somehow this feels so seismic. Uh, yes, there have been many of these situations, many of these videos, but I, I'm, I'm hoping that this one, uh, and I could be wrong, you can tell me I'm wrong right now, I'm hoping this one uh, is getting us, is moving the puzzle piece a little more is that am i wrong am i wrong to be hopeful i think it's an opportunity for that I, I i think i i people ask me if i'm hopeful all the time i'm only hopeful as long as i keep doing the work so i think a lot of times people feel hope like something will happen like you know cops kneeling with protesters people are like oh it's going to get better because cops knelt with protesters but in actuality 
a lot of those same cops or cops in those police departments are, are also the cops who are pepper spraying people, who are, who are shooting rubber bullets at people. In Kansas City, the, some of the cops knelt with protesters and the mayor knelt with co- protesters. And then I think it was the same day, but within 24 hours, cops ran up on a black man who was just screaming at them and, and using his, his freedom of speech and pepper sprayed him right in the face and the people around them and then dragged him out and all wrestled him to the ground in Kansas City, Missouri. Both those things happen in Kansas City. So I think if you're looking for hope, look for it in work. Don't look for it in images or moments. And I think the other thing I would say about that, the way you feel, the way that a lot of white people, and you're saying you feel about what you saw with George Floyd, a lot of black people have felt that repeatedly. Right. I mean, I look at Eric, Eric Garner was the one for me that made me just like, I mean, it was a, I mean, a lot of it was, he was a six foot four, 250 pound black guy. That's my, that's my description. He had asthma. That's my description. When he was saying, I can't breathe, I know a lot of that was because as an asthmatic, you, your lungs fail quicker. And I was like, I felt that feeling of not being able to breathe. And people called him a gentle giant. That's been written about me. So I, the, I feel horrible about George Floyd and I've felt horrible before and a lot of black people yeah. felt horrible before. The thing that makes this moment different, Conan, and I wanna be clear about this, white people had more access to it because we're in the middle of a global pandemic and more of us are at home watching the news. So it's not, a, I don't think it's about that specifically. It's about the fact that maybe before the new clip of the black person being killed by cops would have come across your desk and you just would have pushed it, pushed it aside or you would have watched it once. Right. But if you're watching the news, you're seeing it over and over again because of the fact our country at the top level has failed with dealing with the coronavirus pandemic. So we're all at home watching the news. That's... Uh... I, I have nothing to say to that other than you are uh, you are 100% correct. I really so, do believe I really do believe that that you're right that we all of us had to sit and see that image over and over and over again and that is a situation that's just the situation we're in because of COVID-19 but it's it's too bad. It's it's a shame that it it took that for people to really pay attention. I, can I ask you a question, Conan? Yeah. Do you accept or believe that this country is run by white supremacy? I believe that it's complicated. I don't believe that that is the aim of everybody in this country. I, oh, I don't, and I'm not talking about like the aim of each individual white people. I, you know, I married a white person, so like I'm not, I'm not here to be the anti-white person. I'm just talking about the for, that this country there is a there is forces in place that are institutional and structural that just sort of that promote whiteness over the over other races. Yes. Oh, yes, definitely. I I, I definitely believe that that is inherent in the uh, the mission statement of this country historically, and that it is a, I talked about this on Monday, that it has been a um, long, horrible history of us, and, and people focus so much on slavery, but it goes so much beyond that. And I'll also say it's not just the United States of America, it's, uh, it's a global problem. I think racism uh, is, is built in to many structures around the world. I believe that in my heart. And I think that the history of this country is the spasms of trying to confront it and trying to uh, improve it. And we have these moments where I think people, and I'm gonna say be specific, where I think white people can feel like we did it, we got there, Uh, the, the second, the first election of uh, Barack Obama and then the second one had us feeling in a naive sense, we did it, we're there. We're not there, do you know? We're, we're far from there. I don't even know what there is. I don't, we may never completely be there because it's, it's like doing, um, I, I like analogies because that's yeah. the way my brain works, but when you're working out or taking care of your body, you're never there. It is, it's like what you're talking about. You got to do the work. You don't finish doing sit-ups and say, I'm done, I'm there. Yes. It is a, and I'm, this is coming from someone who does not do sit-ups. Uh, yeah. <laughs> let me make that really clear. Um, it is, 
this is the work that doesn't end. It does not end. So I do think there are moments. I grew up in a very, I, I, I grew up in Boston. So it's a, it's, a, it's a city with a terrible racist history and racial past and still confronts racial problems. But I grew up in a very liberal public school system in the 70s where uh, you know, people are wearing dashikis and I, I grew up with black friends and I really did think racism of, is a thing of the past. And this is in the 1970s. I really believed that we had, and, and this is only 10 years after the, the worst of the civil rights struggles. I believed that as a child, like, well, at least I think we took care of racism. That's because I was living in a little bubble and um, I was a kid and was all I've been my whole life since then. And I'm now 57 years old has been learning over and over and over again that there's so much to be done. There's so much work to do and being filled with optimism and then despair. So that's the cycle. Uh, and and um, yes, I think that America is a work in progress is, is been my motto. It is a, still a young country and it's a country that has a lot of work to do. I mean, I, I, I hear what you're saying. I think that some people, I think some people, there's, I've seen a meme going around, some people saying the system isn't broken. The system was designed to do this. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what, some, that's what a lot of black people feel like. It's like, this is actually, since black people were freed from enslavement, the system has worked hard to keep us as close to that as possible through not giving, not giving us access to the vote, through not giving, our, not giving, allowing us to have the same access to a good education as white folks, mm -hmm. through incarcerating more people than the rest of the world does, and more of those people are black than proportionally should right. be. So right. the system has designed to do this. So even the fact that the election of Barack Obama, the system's response was Donald Trump. Yes. And that happens through not just like because Trump is a bloviating uh, sort of like soundbite machine and people like that. It's because through gerrymandered districts, through the electoral college, not valuing the popular vote, the system has controls in place for things to be more inclusive and more equitable. And I, that's what I mean when I say white supremacy, because it's like yeah. I think a lot of times white people get caught up in white supremacist and white supremacy. A white supremacist is the Ku Klux Klan. We don't even need to really be worried about them for the most part. They are, they are the mascots of white supremacy. Right. Uh, white, suprem white supremacy is 44 out of 45 American presidents being white men. That's the system that is, that has, you think they just, those just happen to be, the, it just happened to be 40 uh, white men that happen to be the best president. That's the system putting things in place. Like we can't get access to the to the Ivy League inner circle conversations that white that white people can. So we don't have the groups. We don't have people. We don't have the wealth around us to fund a race for presidency. And we don't have those sort of like just social circles where we would wind up in places where somebody be like, "You should run for president." And here's how we're going to make it happen. That's the right. that's the system of white supremacy. That is, and I think white people need to be very clear about that. That's. A lot of times white people can feel very comfortable going, I don't like that cop who did that bad thing. But the system means that if you become a cop, you adopt racism or, you're, or you either adopt it or you ignore it. Because that's the other part. A lot of good cops, but there's a lot of quote unquote good cops watching bad cops do that and not stepping up and not stopping it. There was four yeah. cops that could have stepped up and said, stop this, who didn't. And, and who may or may not be, by the time this airs, maybe they've been arrested or charged but they didn't do anything. If that, they would have been heroes if any one of them had stepped up, but cops don't do that. It's the system of white supremacy that, that encourages cops not to, not to speak out against other cops. Yeah, I think the, the, when you bring up white supremacy, obviously people go right to neo-Nazi, uh, fascism. Um, they, they, they go to an extreme uh, rather than understanding that yes, Anyone who says the skids haven't been greased for white people in this country is a uh, moron. So, um, th th uh, absolutely, absolutely agree with that belief. And they've been greased in both directions. They've been greased for you to go up and they've been greased for black people to not be able to get any traction on the way up. So I think that's the, it's both and. And I think that's the thing we wanna get to is that it's both and. I think a lot of times, again, it's the same thing you're saying about working out. 
if you want to feel good about your body and you don't work it that often, you look at somebody who works out less than you. You don't look at the, you don't look at the, you don't look at a photo of Bruce Lee. You, you look at somebody right. like, and so I think a lot of times white people like to sort of like to center, center the neo-Nazi, the Ku Klux Klan, the alt-right going, I'm not as bad as that, so I'm a good person. Instead of looking at white people like my friend and uh, Kate Schatz or Jane Elliott or all, these, or all these other white people out there who are on the front lines of the work. And who, are, and who are invested in being able to say white supremacy is the rule of the land. As a white person, my voice is more valuable in dismantling that system because of white supremacy than a black person's. Um, a couple of things. I want to make sure that we get the word out on the causes that you think are, uh, are, are really going to help and make a, a difference and a practical difference so that people can be throwing buckets of water on the fire now. And so um, I want to make sure that we post those and we put those out on our social media. Uh, I also want to do everything I can. My, my, my education as a, as, as a white man, someone who's, I, I want to make sure that this person who's taking care of me and is taking on my whiteness, Kate, uh, Kate I want to make sure that uh, Kate shots, I want to make sure that she's promoted and uh, that, yes. that, that it's not just my education because God knows there's a lot to be done, but that it's everybody's education. Mm -hmm. So Absolutely. we'll make sure we do that. Is there anything you wanted to say before we, we, uh, we end this for tonight? No, I think it's, it's really important to, uh, first of all, thank you for having me on the show. You honored, know, I, honored to have you, always honored to have you. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I appreciate the fact that, that you're having these conversations and other late night show hosts are doing this at this time. And it's personally somebody who's not, I've seen you speak out before and you've inspired me before when you've spoken out, uh, you know, whether this airs or not, how you left the Tonight Show and what you said about snark and being mm -hmm. mean really has stayed with me. Oh, good. Okay. And it really helped get it helped me get through a hard part of my career. So you specifically have helped me. Well, so I appreciate you doing this right now. Um, I love that you came on the show today, and uh, we need to make this uh, a regular gig. I know you've been on. Uh, we've talked many times before, but we need to keep it going. We need to keep it going. And, uh, and then, um, and you're really, <laughs> it's on top of everything else, you're a very funny man. And I, <laughs> and I believe that that's a superpower that is a beautiful thing, especially in, in times of real sadness and tragedy. And you have that superpower. And I'm so, I'm just, uh, I'm great. I'm very grateful to you in so many ways. Thank you, Conan. And, I, and thank you for using, you know, the word platform is overused, but it's really important to use your platform. And like, I would just encourage you to show your, show your work, you know, okay. to have these conversations, but also show the changes that come from it. Uh, it will happen. It will happen. Um, well, that is our, that is our night. That is our, I think we've, this is the longest I've ever spoken to anybody <laughs> <laughs> on any show. And you know what? I was just, uh, I absolutely loved it. This is, uh, so thank you so much. And uh, we will get the word out and uh, I'll do the work and let's all do the work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. I would do that back at you, but I'm not sure I'm supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kate will build you up to that. I'll let Kate handle that. <laughs> If you'd like more information on some of the causes W. Kamau supports, here are ones that will help put the fire out now. Live Free USA Org, which provides masks for the Black and Hispanic people hardest hit by COVID-19. Donors Choose, which is helping disadvantaged children with distance learning. And to rebuild the house, BlackToTheFuture.org, which works to enact policies that improve the lives of Black people. And you can follow the person in charge of my whiteness, Kate Schatz at at Kate Schatz. She's the author of the Rad American Women series and man is her work cut out for her. You can see W. Camel Bell's United Shades of America with W. Camel Bell when it returns for its fifth season later this month on CNN. Good night.